I look from coming in, but yeah, it is being recorded, but that's all right. I'll come just to me. Got it. When is our next meeting for HRC? The 21st? Yes, yes the 21st. Okay. Yep. So there are four people here. So it's either Philip twice or Tyler is coming in. Oh, there's an attendee. Oh, that's Tyler. Let me move him over to panelists. Okay, great. There we go. So Philip, you're also going to be here in July, right? Yep, I'll be here for the July meeting. The July meeting, great. Yep. I'm having trouble letting go of the strings. <laughs> a, lot, a lot of people are. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think if the survival could find a way to keep you in the survival center, if they could find yeah. a way to keep you remote, I think they would. <laughs> yeah. So, cooking Tyler. psychically. What happened? Psychic cooking. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so, Tyler, can you hear us? Because it says yeah, that yes. you're okay you just have yeah, your okay. he has this all right yeah your videos off okay great so we're all here all right welcome everybody thank you for coming purpose of the meeting is to deal with some bylaws here and uh any type of revisions that we want to add in from the first time go around and Pamela, is there a document that has all three of our revisions or is there just individual revisions going to the attorney? Um, there is not a document where I've incorporated uh, the three. So okay. I, I can do that following this meeting. Um, so I thought the final document was the one Tyler said sent because he said it's the up-to-date document. Oh. Tyler, is that in inclusive of the comments? Or is it just your up to date? Um, it has. I read through your comments uh, right before I wrote it, uh, mm -hmm. but that was from before I got Phillips. So um, oh. that one was really just more uh, my up to date. Okay, so the, I worked off of that one. Yeah, uh, that's fine. We can we can right. work off of that one. I don't, I don't think I had too much changes on my end. I think. One thing that I did add, and I don't know if you added it, Tyler, was that when we refer to director on mm. the bylaws, yeah, I think it, um, it should just be added in um, DI director, being that that's who it is. I, I, it, yeah, I think that that will be a call for um, for Paul and for the uh, uh, general counsel. Because, and in the past, the um, right the human resources human resources director, director was yeah it's 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 someone oh. that that he generally um, names but um, and it before we here. can I ask one question I'm sorry to keep interrupting but Tyler I was just going to ask him I did you um, was I included on the email that had um, the most recent version because I will bring that up. I'll look for it and bring it up. I, you guys yeah, I'm pretty sure. Yes. Um, since I think I sent it to you a, a few months ago and then I included it again in the email chain uh, like last month. Okay. I'm going to look for that now. I think. So, so okay. on the question uh, of on the question of the director, Mm -hmm. The document well, says there shall be a human rights director, which we can right. remove if it and just reference the DEI director and, and then let the town manager, you know, say no. That's what's causing the confusion about the director. Right. And that's that's what I think should happen, to be honest. And I mean, I I don't know if you have to talk to Paul on that one, Pamela, mm -hmm. or if you have to okay. approve it, but I really do think that. So you're that, deleting section D which says there shall be a human rights director and changing all the, the director to DEI director. And that's well, it, I if mean, it is you. Yeah, I, the way that I worded it on my end was 
there shall be a human rights director, and then in quotations, um, the director, who shall be appointed by the town manager, which is now the DEI director, or director of DEI. And then from there, every time that director gets referred, it's just, and at least the way that I saw it written out, would be the DEI director instead of just the director. Yes, I like that. So we've skipped a little bit here. Maybe we should go to the beginning. Right. Yes, because those definitions, I think we really need. I, I yeah, will so, say I am not in favor of the genetic. Um, right. I'm not either. I did send some alternatives in an attachment. Right. Okay. So what I did was to just pull out some definitions from various human rights documents. And the one I like best is from the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights which says human rights are rights we have simply because we exist as human beings. They're not guaranteed by any state. These universal rights are inherent to us all, regardless of nationality, sex, national or ethnic origin, color, religion, language, or any other status. They range from the most fundamental, the right to life, to those that make life worth living, such as rights to food, education, work, health, and liberty. That's the second of the three things I pulled out from just by looking at UN, uh, UDHR and uh, UN.org. That's what I was meaning when I said we should define it because the scope yeah. of human rights, that it covers think, this thing and that yeah. it's... Yeah, my, my guess is that this definition was uh, probably added when the Massachusetts uh, amended their... Um, they're protected classes to include gender identity, and I, I, I. But that's a guess. I don't. I don't know. Right. Um, but you know, it's all included in this right. idea of human rights. Right. right. Um, so, so, I'm gonna. Tr I am really a horrible typist, but I am going to try to cut and paste and add things as we go through. Yeah, um, from 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 one document to the next. So let me. So Pamela, I just I sent an email just before the meeting with these definitions. Mm -hmm. Yep, I so, have it. Yeah. yeah. So okay. Yeah. Tyler, do you feel I, any type of way about um the genetic information or gender identity? Because mm, about genetic information, I think that I wrote something about it actually in one of mm -hmm. the documents. I don't like it much since it's way too ambiguous what exactly it's pointing to yeah. i do get the idea behind adding it which is that like genetic information can be the basis for all sorts of discrimination but it also opens these whole cans of worms of what sort of factors you're counting in that and it could potentially cause issues medically for example because there's now uh, a lot of talk about race-based uh, medicine because there's a tiny subset of conditions where it's medical treatment might differ between people with different genetic backgrounds, which usually tend to correlate with the race nowadays. But I mean, like 23andMe is trying to create a whole medical uh, offset of their company. So it, it's a really problematic thing to include, um, I think. And while not, it, it wouldn't be impossible to include it or wholly illogical, but it probably is... Uh, more trouble than it's worth, in my opinion. I think, though, with gender identity, we should add that in. Like, I'm looking at the UN definitions. I think the one on just the UN.org website is probably the most concise and easiest to work with. If we just add it into that, like, gender identity and sexuality, uh, in addition to that, any other status catch-all, then that probably should be, like, good to go. Hey, um so I'm sharing screen. Can you guys see the definition? Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. So, um, and I, I like that definition, uh, Ronnie. Thank you for finding that on online. I, I, I felt comfortable with the human rights definition being added in there. Well, the um, definition, if you're citing the definition, it doesn't say gender identity. It says sex. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so if we want to say gender identity, it needs to be another line. Okay. Or right. we cannot, or we can say adapted from. Right. right. When we reference it, then, you know. 
Um, and yeah. I can, I can. Yeah. And I obviously this will need to be cleaned up. So right. mm -hmm. Ex expect a lot of typos as I try to cut and paste as you go through. <laughs> yeah, there's one really interesting typo in here. I guess we'll get to it. <laughs> All right. So that so that's the definition so, section. Is there more for definitions or are you? Now at no person shall be denied any rights guaranteed. Well, I think we're taking out genetic information, right? Is that what right. everybody likes? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. I don't know if I can del delete all of that. So that's all struck. Well, the no person shall part simply makes it more specific relevant to the legal context of this particular commission or the bylaw to this, to Amherst, I guess. Right. Because it references the local Commonwealth or federal law, which I think is fine. I think this one also has genetic information, so that would be struck mm -hmm. from that. Um, I do notice that Philip's version of it differed from mine, since he just used marginalized identity groups. Um, and then I had a list, and I think both directions of just using a single term to refer to any group and listing off examples could work. Um, or we could go back and refer up to the human rights definition, but I don't know quick way to do that. So which which definition are you are you are you on on what's currently listed as C the basis oh, okay. on which uh, one might discriminate. Um, okay. Yeah. yeah. But I'm I guess I'm confused by what um, what part of that definition you want to change or you just want to make sure that that um, that a and b are currently the human rights definition and this um, section now c but will be b is uh identical well i'm fine with it as it oh. currently is it's just um philip's version of it had a different phrasing uh his phrasing left it as on the basis of the marginalized identity groups, whereas mine, the one that's shown here, has a list of groups upon which one might face discrimination. OK. Yeah, I'm I'm OK going with the more specific, um, like one that base discrimination. But I do think that if we are going to have the human rights definition that you bring up a good point, Tyler, we should probably start from where it says regardless of nationality and then follow that format. Actually, I like having this as it is. I don't think there's a format problem. I honestly don't. The only, um, because this is really referring to a different set of legal um, codes or whatever they're called, different set of laws. Um, and it's referring to laws versus like the UDHR, which is only an international convention, really. It's not really a law. Mm -hmm. So I think it's important to state this in a, as its own category. Um, I, I just, yeah, the only other thing I think is that maybe gender identity, because it's here in the legal category, doesn't need to be up in the other. And the other can be the very overarching thing. And this can be more specifically what our laws apply us to. I don't know. But I don't want to take it out. I think it's strong as it is. I'd like to keep it. <laughs> well, this is what a think? four uh, to three. You guys <laughs> have to debate it. I will say this. Do we have I, to like go ahead. Um, that I, I agree with you that the language here does refer to very specific state and federal laws. 
Um, so there is a distinction between this section and the universal de uh, declaration, which is why um, I said I, um, I'm pretty sure that that definition around um, genetic identity uh, um, and genetic information was added after the state added those protections to their state law. Um, So let me ask Philip and Tyler, you guys want to take this out and have just the one category, is that it? In definition, instead of A and B, you just want to have A and incorporate and leave it? No, I, th I thought that what Philip was saying was that the language in A should be the language that's in B, that the language right. should mirror each other. Right. So I, I'm fine keeping it as is, but where it says like such as on B, how it starts out with sex, just make it start out with nationality from the human rights oh, definition. I and see. then from there on, I see. all the classes. Mm -hmm. Okay. I think that it will have less power if we do that because to the reader, it's going to read like more of the same. But I see that it's stronger. I see what you're trying to do. I understand now, and I'm okay with it. If you and if Philip and Tyler agree, then I'm okay with it. I will tell my Tyler, are you still there? Yeah. Okay. All right. And I... Jen, can I? Oh, I'm sorry to interrupt you, Tyler. But I'm going to ask Jen to make to take notes because I'll have to go back. I mean, I'm. You know, just make sure that as that I get everything correctly as we're trying to do it. So it'd be helpful if you just jot down things for me so that I. So I'm I, withdrawing my objection. Yeah, I think with duplicating them, the big issue that I see with that is that the point of having this uh, such as list of categories is that it's not exclusive. It's an inclusive list and almost certainly like 10 years from now, there's gonna be different phrasings for each of the categories or different categories entirely that we're not presently thinking of. Um, and duplicating a list exactly almost gives more weight to that list. Since this is within a single bylaw of a single towns, uh, I think like a, basically a subsection of the town bylaws, I doubt that it really matters that much, but all the same, I think that when we have set, different lists within the same bylaw, it does kind of send the message that this very much is an inclusive and open list. Um, but from a consistency standpoint and just the immediate usability and aesthetics of the bylaw duplicating the list could be beneficial, especially since what I have in C, I actually just tried to include as many conditions as I could reasonably think of to the point that gender and gender identity and expression are both listed in separate um, items. So, and I think also political and other opinion is redundant with religion. Uh, and then, I don't know, there's a couple of others that are certainly redundant with each other. I think sex ends up redundant with multiple of them, at least under the Bostock reading. Uh, but, well, actually, I have race and ethnic origin. So yeah, it, there's there's definitely redundancies in the way that it's phrased right now. That's kind of what I'm a little bit more hesitant towards, since I think it might somewhat dilute the power of the bylaw to have so many redundancies. But at the same time, it does unquestionably make it more comprehensive and pretty much guarantee that we capture everything. It's just not as readable. So I, I'm I'm. I'm going to ask you guys. Obviously, we'll we will uh, adapt the do the document how you want to. But I do think that you should consider the distinction between the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and state and federal uh, law. And there's a there is a big difference. And so this section begins with, you know, persons shall be denied rights guaranteed local, commonwealth, or federal. And and I, you know, I hate to say it, but I do believe that there are some things that are listed in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights that are not protected uh, necessarily by local, state or federal law. Um, and so uh, what would be the legal basis for 
the statute that we could point to that says that you have a right to food. Mm. You know, I'm just using that as an example, right? So I my my advice would be to to um to to leave it. You know, I can take out the genetic information, um, but my advice would be to leave it um, as is. I think maybe we should get rid of the redundancy between gender and uh, gender identity, though, since that one, I think, is a little bit excessively redundant, but we'll actually even have an association with the I, I really just listed every, uh, it, I don't, I'm fine with leaving it as is. I just do think that from a usability standpoint, it might be beneficial to clean it up a little bit. Um, given, I, I think every single thing here is redundant with at least one uh, yeah. point, usually two. Well, yeah. the, the question is whether our laws offer these protections or not, because mm -hmm, that's mm -hmm. what B is about. The second right. section is about what's in the law. Right. Like, does the law offer protections for gender identity? Um, I don't know. Uh, if it does, then it's there. If it doesn't, right. um, then it cannot be in C. That's why we've got the first one to say well, that. The phrasing of C is no person shall be denied rights on any ground such as with the list. So because mm -hmm. that it's phrased it says, under that construction, it's not really pointing to a specific law, but rather in itself is stating that the rights already guaranteed under local, local commonwealth or federal law shall be applied to every person within Amherst and not denied on any such basis. But denied on the basis of, on the pursuant to local commonwealth or federal law, which is much more narrow than what the human rights, Declaration of Human Rights talks about. Yeah, so the protections in C would not cover stuff like the right to food or food, yeah. work or anything like that. The, those C would not encompass that under its present construction, unless mm -hmm. the Supreme Court goes and decides to completely reinterpret the Constitution, which they could, um, especially over the course of a decade. But as of right now, the protections in C would differ pretty broadly from the definition of human rights found in um, A. So I think um, by your own argument, Tyler, we should leave it as it is, because it is it really does refer um, very specifically to uh, to laws that are either state or federal. And I, I yeah. think um, and I also think that um, from a legal standpoint, although you might um, consider gender and gender identity redundant, there are probably um, state case laws that define them. And so they're not considered redundant, they, they probably have a legal definition and case law um, to explain them, which is why they're included um, this way. Yeah. Um, just so for clarification, that section B and C that you're going to leave as is? Yeah, this section right here, we're going to leave. Yeah. All right, so I'm going to scroll down. No changes to this or? Um, just the references to the director. Okay. That's in D. I was wondering if we could move that up and say what we discussed earlier. Before we say the director, if we could move up. So that's C, before we say there shall be a human rights commission, there shall be a human rights director. And as Philip described what it should be. So then when you say director for the rest of it, it makes sense. Okay. All right. So. So. Oh, so this that sentence one, here, that right here. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. You want to cut and. Um, Put it above, there shall be human rights commission. Okay. Above there should be. I think, yeah. it, I think. Because, uh, go ahead. Well, I think um, I, I understand the director, but I think the commission comes after the, the director comes after the com 
the commission. So I would add it, I would maybe add it to this sentence here. Let's try, I'm just gonna try that. Yeah. Not know. I think um, the thing about Philip's point was that it would describe, I don't know, where is Philip? He went off my screen, but he yes. was saying okay. something about clarifying that the director is the DEI director. There was language that, I don't know, Philip, if you still have it. Right, yeah, said yeah. yeah, after where it says, who shall be appointed by town manager, which is now the, D, or the director of DEI. Okay, so, well, again, ignore the typos. So, and we know that we'll have to clean all this up, so. Yeah. Uh, I don't have any idea why that is font is so small. It's always too small. Mm -hmm. These screens are a real challenge. I'm I'm trying to point to it, and I know you can't <laughs> see it, so I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. But if you go down in the right hand corner, it like oh, you still I'm circling it, and you can't see it. But all the yeah. way down in the right hand corner of the screen of this of the entire word document oh yep and move that yeah, yeah there you go that's yep it. and okay. move that all right okay it was at like 25 percent. so we... yeah on oh that's weird so on my screen of course it's it does yeah it's always trying to figure out you guys are really small on my screen so i can have the document big so all right so let, i just there should be a human rights commission of nine Amherst residents, broadly representative of the community, appointed to three-year terms by the town manager. The commission shall advise the town, provide education and mediation to the community. There shall be a human rights director. The director shall be appointed by the town manager, which is now the director of the Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. Mm -hmm. But doesn't that sound like it's its own sentence? Which, this, which... What? There, there shall be a human rights director. Just like, shouldn't well, that just be F? Um, uh, yeah, I mean, it could be. So uh, this sentence, which was part of E, is now sort of hanging out there. This sentence, what that's one, it was actually continued with E, yeah. And all then right. two and three all followed with E. Right. So maybe we should just go back to where the human rights director was, because I think it either has to go before the commission or it has to come after. It can't seem, seems hard to put it in the middle. <laughs> well, you can I just hit undo. Before, well, but... So I would actually just repeat the sentence because the repetition is not going to necessarily be. Uh, oh, I copied the wrong thing. This is what happens when I am in charge of stuff. Okay. The commission shall advise all yeah. of that. Copy. Is one. Yeah. yeah. Uh oh. Uh, okay. Okay, there should be a human rights commission.
All right, there should be a human rights commission. The commission shall advise the town, provide education and mediation to the community. There shall be a human rights director who shall be appointed by the town manager, which is now the director of the Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. The commission shall review all matters brought to its attention by the director. And then the rest of the, of the language would stay as it was. Yeah, that works. Yeah. Okay. Are we then moving on to which is the old section D? What is was it the new section now? Mm -hmm. Okay, so I need to go back to Tyler's document. Or no, this is I Isn't this is so this is right, right. So is this the new section? This doesn't Yeah, it's the next section. Okay. This was under section D before. It was okay. under the let's just say it was under the what the director would do. Do oh, right. 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 So you can just make it another section and say the director shall enforce, the director shall blah blah blah. Right. right. Yeah. yeah. And then in conjunction. In conjugation really sounds weird. Uh, yeah. <laughs> in conjunction with the commission. Oh in yeah. Conjugation. <laughs> I think that's a great error. <laughs> <laughs> in this I think I might have just let um spell check automatically fill it out yeah, for me. Yeah. Like nine times. Oh, was out of it, 10, was that, that you, works. Tyler? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Never trust the spell check. Right. Yeah, for real. In this section, I, I think um, something should be added in, and I don't have language for it, so I'm up for others' interpretation of what they want to add in, but that the director shall um, summarize or share complaints with either the chair or co-chairs um, from the findings of complaints through the town. I think that's an important piece to add into the bylaw. It's there already. It's there. Look at the bottom of that paragraph. It says the director shall inform the chair and vice chair or co-chairs of the commission of all complaints against. That's, oh, that's this is only the town manager and town council. You are right. Yeah, it's not and here. It's, and it's just informing. It's not sharing summarizations of the complaints, right? So it's like. Ah, good point. Yeah. So that's another point, actually. Yeah, sub point. Yeah, right. So I'm going to yeah. actually create. Um, does it need to read so specific to the town manager and town council? When I think it does because where it goes is different for the town manager and for the town council. The town right. manager's complaint is referred to the town council, but a complaint right. of the town council has to go somewhere else, right? Reported to a government agent, governmental agency yeah. having jurisdiction. Yeah. We'd have to figure that out first. <laughs> okay. So I think that sentence uh, cleaned up a little bit, Philip, with address your the director shall inform the chair and vice chair or co chairs of the commission of all complaints and right. provide a summary. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Okay. So here's the a thinking, written summary. Well, I was just going to say here's the thinking about um, about a written summary. If we if a a, a, a a written summary will create a public record that would be right. um, so you won't be able to protect the privacy of the individual. I I think there's very little um, chance of protecting privacy anyway, but definitely if there's a written document. Um, th there will be no privacy. So. Well, I mean, I guess, why couldn't you just, I mean, so other outside of knowing the scenario, maybe you wouldn't, you just redact the other information, like the individual's name, we still have the right to redact specific information. That's true. 
I'm okay with leaving the vagueness of provide a summary and the director and co-chairs at the time can mm -hmm. decide how that summary is given. Mm -hmm. No, I, Me that too. makes sense. Yeah. So I have a sort of a question related to this. So is the idea that when there's a complaint, the commission won't necessarily, commission members won't necessarily know even that there's been a complaint, it will only be the co-chairs of the Human Rights Commission who would know. Yeah, that's been the current who decided practice. That? I mean, is that written in stone? Jen, I'm thinking if there's a member of the commission who has expertise in the subject matter of the complaint, then it would seem like that's a resource we're not using. Why have a commission then? Well, I mean, I think that's been something that's come up. And so if you recall, when these bylaws were made, we were meeting in person. So then you're expecting the person who's filing the complaint to come towards the entire commission. But as far as you know, the complaint the person being complained about could be at that meeting, right? Do you understand what I'm saying? And because so because it's an was, open meeting. Because it's an open I, meeting. Yeah. I'm and so sorry, all I this wasn't is, here for that. No, I know. I understand. That's why I'm explaining it. So all this really is is like, you know, we meet differently, but there's a possibility that we might go back to meeting in person again and not be meeting on online so you have to figure out and when we're meeting online these are recorded meetings so it, either way you know someone ha has the right to to see this so if if we were all at an hrc meeting and somebody wanted to bring a complaint that just seems like something that would be uncomfortable yeah. no sorry or... that's not what i'm suggesting mm -hmm. i'm suggesting that in this phase where info you know I, the the complaint is going to DEI, that director is the one who's really managing the complaint, right? Then that complaint, that person is working with the co-chairs in some way, including at the end. Yeah. I'm just wondering why it's only the co-chairs, because especially I'm thinking of one new member who has tremendous expertise, it sounds like, in human rights. And it would be a shame if she weren't a co-chair for her not to be drawn upon as a resource well i don't know that she wouldn't necessarily be able to be drawn upon a resource but it's we're saying here that it's confidential to only the co-chairs that's why i'm questioning whether we should add something like that that the dei director that the director shall draw upon any resource within the hrc or something like that it just seems a shame to narrow it to these positions called chairs when the commission is rich with different kinds of expertise no i understand what you're saying and i don't i i think from my perspective i if if i felt like there was somebody in the in the so if there was a complaint and we needed to talk to the police chief but the complaint wasn't about him but we wanted his expertise we would just call the chief i don't understand why we wouldn't just call on the member as a as an individual i don't think you could under these bylaws because it says that the only person that the director shall deal with is really the it, chairs it's just but in the I'm, investigation i yeah. would rather i would rather make it clear that they you can call on whoever you want on the commission I don't know if there are though, Philip. I don't know. What do you think, having sat on these things for a while? I, I mean, don't know if you've dealt with any I don't, complaints. I don't think it harms it to add it in to mm -hmm. a subsection to add in like anybody for their expertise can be called upon. Uh, as far as complaints going, it's more of a. It's other you know, members of. Yeah, it's other members of the HRC may be called upon by the director as appropriate or something. Yeah, and I think to Jen's point, I, at least this current team, and obviously we need to think about future people and whoever holds the position, that's that's not an issue I find with, with Jen and Pamela <laughs> anyways. <laughs> but but I think it's a good point. I mean, what if I'm coming with a complaint about somebody to the commission and that person happens to be sitting there listening right. to the meeting, you know? Uh -huh. <laughs> Exactly. Uh, 
But the complaint isn't coming to the, we're not saying the complaint should come to the commission. We're just saying that in the, that the director should be able to call on the expertise of the commission. Yeah. Is, is that okay with you, Jen? I'm just curious what you're thinking. You're muted. Oh. I, 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 so for me, I still like, to me, it doesn't say you can or cannot do that. So to Philip's point, it doesn't hurt to add that in there. I would have just done that anyways, personally, because it doesn't say that I can't. It doesn't say that I can, but it doesn't say that I can't, right? Right. No. I and think it's, it's not, good. I think it's, it's, yeah. it's good for these types of documents to think far into the future of when, you know, some of us are no longer a part of the team and that way it's written in there for people that can then refer back and be like, oh, you can utilize this. Mm -hmm. Okay. So is that clause okay? Utilize any member of the Human Rights Commission with subject matter expertise and provide a summary of the final outcome? I and think, we'll give uh, Go ahead. And this is section D7, is that correct? I I got a little bit confused with where the numbers were. Yeah, yeah I think it, it will be D6. I think we'll have to clean it up a little bit, but it will. Um... I think under provide a summary of the final outcomes, is that going to the whole commission? Because I think that's the way that it reads right now. Okay. Okay, so. Well, the whole commission doesn't know about it, so right. it's not going to the whole commission, commission unless we decide that the whole commission needs to know, but nine people is a lot of people in a small town. I, right. I guess I'm okay not knowing. Right. Um, and that's why I'm just saying to have some clarity on the, yeah. the sentence there. Yeah. I think that's all I had for that section. If anybody had anybody anything else. So, but don't you think like, and I and hopefully this makes sense. So the way that we were doing it before is like quarterly, in theory, we would give a report to the HRC mem to the whole entire commission because you could exclude whatever information. So you could make it as general as saying there were four complaints from about the Jones Library. There were three complaints about whatever. That way, if there were like eight complaints of re regarding one area in a small time frame, then that is an indicator to the HRC that they really need to maybe look into something there, or maybe that's just limited to the co-chairs and the chairs. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. I think the co-chairs uh, would always have the ability to um, to bring, the information before the whole commission. And because um, I, I, I'm assuming that at some point there we would be writing a summary just as you've described for the final HRC report. The annual report has to have some, you know, small two or three sentence description of, of, of the actions that have come in. Yeah. So I think you can still achieve what you want with the text as it's written. Yeah. So I think um, what, I was, what I was seeing on some other towns bylaws, and thank you, Pamela, for sending that out, was there was language that signaled init like initiate an investigation in that way. And I think that that it's important, especially for the HRC, is that that's kind of what this is all doing, right? Is that through all these complaints, it really is 
almost an initial investigation to then guide someone to go to like the federal level of um, dealing with the um, disability um, complaint or uh, complaint against race or um, gender identity. So I don't know if that's in this document right now that Tyler has written, but I, I feel like being more specific, like we talked about Pamela, of what the yeah. expectations are right. from what you're going to get from an HRC complaint, because I think that is not so relatively known right now. I think a lot of people think that we have a lot more power. Than right, than we, we do def actually do. Yeah. So I actually think that that should, this should come into this next section um, because there aren't any procedures uh, that are established. And um, I don't, I can send out to you guys the document that I drafted like last fall, but I think, um, you know, leaving this section in as as it is, is probably okay, but I think that there should be a recommendation that certain specific procedures be established, right? Um, and that would not only help clarify what authority the commission has, but also set some time limits for when things are done. I mean, general practice is 60 to 90 days to, from start to finish would be a good um, time frame, depending on the complexity of, you know, of a case that if you were able to have a complaint in and then respond, you know, obviously you're going to respond right away to the person, but within a 60 to 90 day time frame, come up with whatever solution, resolution, advice, or recommendation um, so that there's an end process and things just, you know, don't languish which unfortunately with my illness, they did like wish on one case in particular. So then are you suggesting to add in uh, procedures? Right, I, I think, and, and I, I think in the original document from last fall, I did um, um, suggest some procedures that might be adopted. They'll have to be adopted by, approved by the town manager and then adopted by the commission. I remember seeing that and the yeah. one time that I made comments, I think there were procedures and there are quite yeah. detailed ones. Right. Yeah. So I would leave this as is and I can, um, you know, I can, we could, I can follow up um, and send you a clean copy of the document after we've gone through it with some suggested procedures um, so that you could see, see them both. I could probably get that to you, I'm gonna say sometime ne mid next week. Is it just the procedures that you already gave us or are they gonna be new ones? No, I think they would, I, I, I think they're basically the procedures that I already gave you, but as a commission, um, you would, when you meet on the 21st, you'd have to, you know, basically uh, discuss them and adopt them and we, then they would need to go to the town manager um, for approval. Right. Okay. And I, and so, and this is where things get a little tricky. So when we were talking about, you know, this section that talks about the public records law, a right against self-incrimination and right to due process. So um, I I'll can just give you an example of how we've been handling the cases. And I think the procedure really reflects, reflects this is that generally when a complaint comes in, Jen and I will meet with the person who's filed the complaint. Then we'll meet with any other interested party or any other people that we need to get information from. Um, I generally then will draft up a summary of the statement from the various parties, send it to them for their review um, so that if I've misinterpreted something or, or something is mistaken, they, they have an opportunity to correct, no, I said this and not that. And then once those final statements come in, then we can make a recommendation about an action that we can take or some suggestion. In um, when I was working as the for North Shore Community um, College, one of the things that we used to require 
and it's sort of required from the intake form is that the um, anybody filing a complaint submit their a written statement because then you have their own actual words about what the issue was. The intake forms are are okay, but they don't provide a lot of detail. And so then it's left for Jennifer and I to meet with the complainant and write down all of that detail to really flush out the complaint. And we have to, you know, there's some back and forth. So um, I, I think that um, in most cases, it, 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 you know, I think having a 90 day window from start to finish is very reasonable. Um, we've had two, five complaints this year if I'm counting correctly, maybe six. Wow. Oh. Yeah, I think, yeah, I think it's six. Yeah, I think, yeah, I'm, I'm thinking six, yeah. So I had a comment on the number eight, the one that says in conjunction with, mm -hmm. and it's not about what you're talking about. It's really about presenting the language it's a bureaucratic comment, I'm sorry to do this, but I feel like in documents like this, it's important to, I want this to link to the international broader human rights agenda. Mm -hmm. And so this is the thing that's really important. It's what you've written down, but I wanted to say in addition, so where it says um, uh, in establishing procedures, the director shall consider the privacy and other rights, I would say the director shall consider the human rights of the applicant, complainant, and witnesses. Mm -hmm. And then in the next sentence, I would say the procedure shall also incorporate the rights to privacy, the rights against self-incrimination, blah, 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 and the reference the laws. It's just sort of connecting it to the bigger human rights thing that we open the document. If you'd like, I can just email you my proposed text and you can do what you want with it. I think that's up to you and Tyler. Tyler, I don't know if you're uh, okay I'm with fine with that. Yeah, um, I'm okay with that. Okay. Okay. All right. Send me the text and I'll put it. Okay. We'll just I'm gonna I'm gonna yeah, just put a little note in here. It doesn't change anything really except to link it back to the bigger, broader view of human rights, which is how I feel like we should see it as beyond the, what the American legal system has to offer, which is not enough protections in my view. But you know, anyway, that's it. So the think, one- Sorry, I was just gonna say in there that um, maybe, and I know that it's with legal bureaucratic stuff that it wouldn't encompass the US, but um, the articles of, um, Declaration of Human Rights could be mm. a great link in that area too. Actually, that was another general comment I had that we should somewhere in here have a link to the UDHR right. because those That's articles your... are so easy. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I'm I'm going to play devil's advocate uh, for a moment and just say I think that. Um, Linking it into the bylaw would probably not be a wise idea, but maybe there is a section where there could be references or uh, some, so it's not some other supplementary materials or something. I don't, I, I'm, I'm concerned a little bit about the legality of linking the universal uh, human rights declaration into the bylaw, but that can also be a question that I could pose to uh, KP law. Yeah, I, I mean, if you can pose it, I, I think that'd be great. But I mm -hmm. do want to say that we should look at the website. And I think that that should for sure be on our website. Of the right. HRC. Right. Yeah. We could also put it down mm -hmm. um, at the end as right references or something like that. Right. So that right. Yeah. it's there. Mm -hmm. I think in the reference section, in references section would be um, would be appropriate, and that you could certainly add it. I think to the um, to the HRC website.
So one suggestion that I have, and this will come with some of the proposals for um, the procedures is to make clear or um, more clear what um, authority or lack thereof the, we have <laughs> to take actions. Because literally this is it, like, um, so um, outside of a, uh, of a town employee, and, I, I'm, and I'm, 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 I'm saying town employee because I think the town manager could mandate, you know, someone, a staff member to participate, uh, but we have no authority to mandate anyone from any of the private parties or businesses who might come before us to enter into a conciliation conference. Yeah, I noticed that issue as well. I think we should have, in addition to the um, mediating role in the uh, reconciliatory uh, process, we might want to also have a purely investigative system where, for example, under, um, I guess now it's 10 in the document, if voluntary action is not forthcoming, then in addition to reporting the matter, forwarding the matter to another agency, the HRC itself probably could still, while not compelling anyone to give testimony or anything that would go outside of the HRC's powers, be able to still investigate the matter and comment upon it using, for example, publicly available information. So news articles, reports by uh, other consulting or investigating agencies and such, and through voluntary cooperation of whichever parties to the uh, situation wish to come before the HRC. Using those resources, the HRC probably could still comment, even though it wouldn't itself be able to resolve the issue in any way. And I think the value of that is a comment by the HRC and recommendations by the HRC could potentially be useful for other uh, governmental agencies, especially like um, the uh, Education Board or the Town Council or any future resident oversight board, even where the HRC wouldn't have been able to itself uh, conduct any sort of reconciliatory process, an HRC investigation using that uh, publicly available and volunteered material and HRC suggestions could still prove much more useful than merely a report. So I'm I'm going to say a couple of things to that. I, I don't know if there is really the manpower for the HRC to conduct investigations. And I think that the process that you just described, Philip actually did this past year in response to the July 5th incident with the police, which was that hear from, and without any references to the bylaw, hear from any party who was willing to um, talk to the commission, um, have the commission discuss um, what they knew about the situation and then forward to um, in the appropriate agency, you know, the thoughts and findings of the commission. I don't I don't know if there's really the capacity for the commission to do an investigation. Investigation to me feels like a really um it carries a lot of weight and i don't yeah. i yeah well and not only that i mean this commission in our bylaws like we don't have subpoena power so it would be completely voluntary on anyone's end and to your point tyler getting information from public and i mean i'm not a full skeptic of news articles but news articles sometimes have their own way mm. of interpreting information and so i would be wary on having that as evidence if it's an investigation matter into that. I think that I I would say that I liked the fact of the July 5th incident that we were able to speak publicly about it and open up um, a complaint from the HRC to the PD. So I like 
in my notes, I like wrote keeping it vague does have its benefits rather than getting <laughs> fully into the scope because I, I mean, and I, I will be as honest as I want to be right now in that there are certain individuals in town that I think if we start to narrow down what the power of the HRC is, we will get told we don't have the right to do whatever it is that we're trying to do. So one thing that would help me, and maybe it's being new here, it, what, I mean, what kinds of complaints are we getting? Uh, I mean, so, um, so yeah, so I can, um, the first complaint that we got was um, a former Amherst resident against uh, a current resident who was um, the person's employer. Um, and it was a very interesting and complex case, but as it turned out, after we reviewed all of the documentations and information submitted, that person had already adjudicated that case in the superior, um, um, yeah, superior court, in the trial court. So there's not going to be anything more that we could do that the trial court hasn't already done. Um, there have been two complaints against uh, Amherst College. Um, for individuals who have received uh, a no trespass uh, notices from the college. And it oh. I've, I've been told that it's the policy and practice of the college to, um, to issue a no trespass if they have an incident with anyone who's a non-student or non-employee. Um, and on their website, there's actually language sort of indicating that that is the practice they have. I do think that that's problematic, but I don't know, you know, I don't think Amherst College is gonna agree to come into a conciliatory conference to make changes to their, um, we've had one, two complaints against uh, town departments. Am I missing anything, Jen? Is that? I would say that is it for this year. Yeah. But there are usually complaints against bigger entities. It's, right. And the, yeah, yeah. And that's why yeah. also too, why I was saying about defining the reality of what the complaint mm -hmm. is going to do, right? For the Amherst College one, at the end of the day, the town of Amherst cannot tell Amherst College to change a policy. We could recommend. No, we can. We can tell them, but they're not going to do it. Is what you're exactly. saying, right? Yeah. yeah. But, yes. <laughs> and so, therefore, then it becomes well, like here's another step higher up that you can go, like legal wise. But that's that's the most that we can do on that. Well, I mean, but so one of... go ahead. So I served on a noise control board, and I know that noise isn't as big a thing as these kinds of violations, but we did have quasi-judiciary authority, and it was not that difficult to convene three of us with the town's lawyer present. And people came, as you said, they have to come. Sometimes they came with a lawyer, sometimes they came by themselves. But uh, if if we told them to do X, Y, and Z, and they didn't, uh, they were required to go to court uh, to talk to a judge about the issue. It left our hands, like we didn't follow up on it, but basically, I'm not sure what the, like if there is a really serious violation, could we not pass it on to somebody else? I mean, does it just die like Amherst College says, okay, I, I don't accept that, tough luck, so, mm -hmm. and that's it? So we, I, I think for, um, oh, I'm sorry, Jennifer, I keep, go ahead and then I'll no, go. You can talk, you can say what, go ahead and then I'll say. Yeah. It might answer some of her questions. Yeah. So for the, um, so the, with every complaint that we receive, we always provide the complainant with information about resources that actually could adjudicate their um, their cases. And so I did forget one. The one I didn't mention was a complaint came in against um, the um, MRS Regional School District. And um, and when that complaint came in, 
I was um, out sick, but I said to Jennifer, tell the person right away, because there's not going to be anything that we can do about this, that they should go to the Mass Commission Against Discrimination. So they're, they're always provided information about uh, a place where they could actually get, um, you know, their case heard and adjudicated, like someone could actually make a, de make a decision that would be, you know, in their favor and has the authority to do the things that we don't, like, you know, we don't have quasi-judicial, we don't have an investigator or, or a subpoena power. So that's also um, a possibility. With the Amherst uh, College uh, complaints, I've uh, I've had a preliminary conversation with Paul about it because it's, it is a little bit problematic because there seems to be a pattern um, I did talk to uh, uh, Chief Livingstone about the situation. He gave me some background, and um, I am going to be meeting with their ombuds um, person, who happens to be a former colleague of mine. So I'll have a, a chance informally to sort of address it. But you know, directly, I don't. I just there's you know, I could send a letter over to the president or the chief of police of Amherst College, and then it would go into the round filing <laughs> container at the end because there's no way to you know mandate and we're trying to really make sure that we keep a good relationship with them right be good partners so i am hoping that we can address it but through informal means um i i was just going to say that even though we don't have any power to make anybody necessarily do anything or change what they're doing, some for the most part, there has been some kind of change, except for maybe recently. But so last year we had one person who complained about Amherst College, right? It's a very similar situation, but there was like a, a sign that wasn't defined that it was no trespassing and so what the result of that was that they changed the sign right which yeah. is what needed to happen and then so there was a complaint with craig stores before uh, last year about the way that they were being treated an individual was being treated and then that individual was told to refer to the policies but they didn't have any policies so then we called and then all of a sudden they had policies right so there sometimes there can we do have some kind of like movement i would say with amherst college though like that's it's pretty serious if anybody does anything one thing wrong there and is trespassed for life and so i would say for something like that that is exactly something that the entire board could think about like i mean maybe you can't do anything but it's worth the it's it's worth somebody doing something consistently because that's pretty harsh they don't have to necessarily become an employee or anything like that but to be banned from the property which amherst college has a lot of property right. that's not necessarily have like a building on it that belongs to you know like a like a school building is because they have that whole part of groff park right that whole path area behind groff park belongs Good, to Amherst really? College it does that oh, I found wow. that out from yeah. that complaint yeah right so there's a yeah, lot of land that person's yeah. trespassed from that whole entire area mm -hmm. for the rest of their life and so it, they're you know it's worth somebody like at some point and I know that yeah. we are but I you know it seems like you could make some noise at least put a little bit of pressure and maybe they won't budge but at least you have the notion yeah. that you tried well and, th and that's I think the importance too of the HRC also is that right we do have human rights commission in our name I think once we start knocking on some doors to your point Jennifer people all of a sudden are like oh someone's paying attention and that mm -hmm. is what I try and convey to um, town residents when they do come up to me with different things and I go oh, like if you do a complaint this is what will happen sometimes it is you know that attention that gets it moving and I think that was relevant in the July 5th incident you know once we filed the complaint then all of a sudden town council is having a meeting about it and CSSJC is getting involved in different things like that so it does have its power in name
Okay, so I'm going to just scroll down. So that was just a list of all of the other agencies that cases could be referred to. I don't, I don't have anything else, Ronnie or Taylor. I had just one small question, the reference to the 10 days, like after the resolution is done. Um, why does it take 10 days to notify the complainant? Oh, where, where? It's, it's E under, oh, we're not there yet. Sorry, I thought it was this E. Yeah, I'm okay with this section. Okay. I'm just wondering why it takes 10 days to just say, okay, after everything's finished. Yeah, I think that's just um, standard practice. Or just, um, just yeah. to give people time. It's 10 okay. working days, so it gives them two weeks. Uh, and then um, at the end of one, it says the commission may issue orders consistent with its findings during the mediation process. I was wondering what that's about. So this the commission's uh, not involved. Right. This I don't think I wrote Tyler, did you write this section? Um or, I um, only added in the two years thing. I think all of the rest of it. Uh well was, actually I added a little thing at the end as well. But I, I think the rest of it came out of the um retreat packet, which had okay. this section as oh. uh proposed procedures. Mm -hmm. And I've that was so long ago, I've even forgotten about it. Oh, yeah, so this, this okay, so I just yeah. didn't understand. Right. So I, I think this sample complaint, um, this complaint resolution pr um, procedures were procedures that are used by the town of Arlington. I think when I when I looked at it in the fall, like they, they had a good plan and that seemed to be the one that I suggested. Hmm. Okay. So I just didn't understand it. What, so you changed it from six months to two years, Tyler? Yeah, um, and I do think it really should be on the longer side there, just because it's, um, I mean, not everyone knows about the Human Rights Commission's uh, complaint procedures, and some of the stuff that we have heard about in the past, I think especially with the school district, has been a traumatic and the sort of thing that you would expect someone to take some time to recover from and not to start worrying about writing complaints and going through uh, various commissions against discrimination, going through court systems and uh, trying to get com trying to get committees like the HRC involved. Uh, and I don't really want to see uh, anyone with a serious complaint be blocked from pursuing either reconciliation or at least some uh, action on it through the HRC simply because of a statute of limitations. Mm -hmm. So, um, I, and I, you know, again, I'm gonna play devil's advocate because this is the document that you're creating for the commission. But if you have a time frame that is beyond the statute of limitations, there is actually no, um, access to the court system if the person comes to us after that mm -hmm. time frame. So mm -hmm. we can, you could you could come and you could have the best case in the world, um, but we couldn't refer you to anyone because you've already missed your statute of limitations on the state side. And for some actions, like the ones that you're suggesting, like the there are some uh, some statutes that have been uh, the statute of the limitations has been uh, eliminated in some cases where there's been, you know, child sexual abuse or domestic abuse, they've been extended. But um, outside of those types of cases, if you if we did this as you suggested, then if someone came to us outside of the six month period, and this might be sufficient for some people, the most we could do would be to ask the person the respondent to come in to, for a conference, but we can't mandate that they come in and there's no other recourse for the complainant because they've missed the statute of limitations. 
I think, though, that six months is probably well within the statute of limitations of probably, I mean, I guess it would vary based on the complaint, but probably a huge chunk of the complaints that we've received, uh, at least where they are applicable to the court systems. And even so, I do think that there's inherent value to having uh, that reconciliatory process be available and to having the potential that even though the HRC might not really be able to investigate or even make recommendations on every complaint before it, at least having a chance that the HRC might be able to do that. I think if we have a more restrictive period in our um, bylaws, something on the order of six months, then we should at least have a mechanism to lengthen that period or grant an exception to it. Since, especially in cases where the statute of limitations has not in fact expired after six months or two years for some of the more severe violations, we probably don't want to be limiting ourselves with that sort of deadline. Well, I, I, yeah, I think this is a this is one where I'm I would probably uh, disagree. I think anything that's a very serious uh, complaint where there would be an extension of a statute of limitation is probably going to be criminal and not going to be coming to the HRC. And um, and most of the other uh, protections that are awarded awarded under the state and federal law have a time frame for for bringing that complaint and and um i i think that the six months is is also mirrored by the um mcad but again this is the document that you guys are proposing so i'm just weighing in my two cents uh, i i i'm hearing both sides right now and i think that there is some common ground in this being that if someone wanted to file a complaint outside of the statute of limitations for legality reasons, I mean, wouldn't our then advice or mediation be that the purposes of for legal, it seems as if it's outside of the scope of um, limitations that they would have. So then therefore you could go and try and file something, but they're going to tell you you're outside of the scope and that would just be us than referring that information to someone. Because I do, reading it, it I, I don't want residents to feel like no complaint shall be considered unless, like that's to me at least strong wording. Mm -hmm. And if it is at the end of the day, like with other things, right? Like with the um, Drake complaint that there is, it's, or the school, it, it becomes that it's, it's not our jurisdiction. It's not anything we can necessarily do. Here's what, we have for you and if an individual took more than six months to come and complain i mean that's that's nothing that we could do about it so i i hear the point of why to add it in but also i i guess i'm going to lean more towards that I, I don't i would argue then that we shouldn't have probably two years or anything i mean Case in point, someone comes like five years from now and wants to bring up something five years from now, it, it just becomes one of those things where it's like, oh, well, you, you're kind of very late on your complaint here. There's not much we can do. And it's frustrating to hear, but it's the reality of the situation. I don't know. Ronnie? Um, I saw that Jennifer has her hand up and then I'll go. Oh. Well, I, I was just thinking that Sometimes, you know, it, I think that really varies on the complaint, right? And because sometimes it's as simple as, you know, I felt this way seven months ago or, or a year ago when I went into the Jones Library. Now I don't want to go in there, which we can still have a conversation with whomever, right? right? So I, but I understand. So I, I guess I'm very similar to Philip with both. I'm very torn about this because, you know, when I had an incident with the police, it took me, it took me a long time to talk to anybody about it. So, um, and it didn't matter that they couldn't, whether they could or could 
couldn't do anything. It was just a matter of being able to say what happened. Um, so I'm very divided about this kind of thing. Um, I wonder if there's some way to say that, you know, complaints not have that first sentence worded quite that way, no complaint shall be considered. But we could say complaints within, you know, whatever, six months, and the language would have to be improved, can be referred, mm -hmm. mediated and referred. Complaints after six months, something about after six months will be heard, but we may not be able to mediate and refer because of the legal context in which we operate or something, or just not, you know, if we usually do refer, then it's, if we could say that after six months, we will not refer. I hate, I, I feel a bit like Tyler. I hate to say no, because this whole thing, when I think of my own experience, it really took me, a, it took me a long time to even tell it to myself. So then we have to ask, is the Human Rights Commission like this? Like, what's our role? Is it our job to be listening to people who take one year to come and tell you about something that there's nothing you can do about? I think it's helpful for us to know about it. You know, let's say there was a consent search conducted that somebody was, that really somebody felt so violated they didn't because they did consent and they don't want to talk about it, I think it's important for us or somebody in government, somebody related to government to know about that, because that then we may recommend policies not to have consent searches. I don't know, I'm just using that as an example. That wasn't my, my case was different. Yeah. But so because I, that's, oh, because, I'm sorry. That was a leap, because that was a leap recommendation and it's something that I advocate for. Uh, it's it's what and a case in point. So I'm sorry to prolong this discussion, but is there a way to do both? So I think I can try to think about how I might um, rephrase that. Uh, I think it, you. I think providing notice that if your 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 complaint is filed within the six months, that it might be mediated or referred to MCAD is really important because. Um, mm -hmm. Folks need to know that they they there's a time frame for their, mm -hmm. you know, for their action to take place, right. and 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 if they're is, if they're beyond that, that you know, the commission maybe maybe will, will is willing to listen to the complaint, but maybe limited in what response they have. So I'll try to work on that language. Yeah, I'd be content with that. Yeah, I just I think to the point, I. I lean with Tyler and Ronnie. I don't want anybody to feel like, oh, well, I can't go to anybody now. Yeah, because it's been seven months, yeah. Right, sometimes just hearing out someone, especially in the work that we do here at the Survival Center, like that's just all someone wants or needs. And mm -hmm. I, I would hate to take that away from someone just because then they read, oh, I'm not here within six months. Okay, so uh, I'll have to work on revising this section here, which I think, um, is all about referral of cases to the MCAD. Yeah. I sent that over to you right now too, before yeah. I noticed that it was on this document, Pamela, so you could ignore my email. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so I think this is. Yeah, and, and then, uh, you know, all of this is language, I think, again, that came from the um, Arlington, uh, town of Arlington, to, so. Yeah. And I think it's this language here, which I have to, I, I'd have to go back and look at that. So the director shall not disclose the terms of mediation when the complainant has been disposed of in this manner unless both parties agree to the disclosure, the commission may issue orders consistent with its findings under their mediation process. And this language was included to avoid the public records, um, uh, to create some pr privacy, so. Yeah. 
I think I'm good with where it is. Yeah. Uh, if everybody mm -hmm. else. Is. Yeah. Yeah. So Tyler, you struck out um, and I um, this section. So in the case of 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 such a finding of a more serious nature, the commission may issue a private reprimand to the respondent. A party uh, receiving a private reprimand shall not be eligible for similar disposition um, for two years. It, it, do you wanna talk about why you struck that out? I think a good example of why this might not be a great section to have would be when that party might be a larger institution, for example, Amherst College or the Amherst Police Department or Jones Library. Mm -hmm. If we were to enter a situation in which they were willing to participate in these mediation procedures, which they likely, each one individually likely won't, but it's definitely conceivable that one of those large entities that's frequently on the receiving end of these complaints might eventually, at least for some period, decide that they're willing to participate in mediation and reconciliation, they would likely receive a substantial volume of complaints just simply because of the amount that they do, the scope of their activities. And it's fairly likely that they would get multiple separate uh, complaints about different incidents within the span of two years of each other that could potentially qualify for a finding of a mere of a more serious nature under section 33 uh, and i don't think that it really makes sense to preclude them from receiving multiple such reprimands uh, within a short time frame of each other if that was to be the case i don't i mean i don't really fully get the logic behind behind having it, um, since it seems like if someone does behavior that qualifies for private reprimand, then they should receive that reprimand. It seems somewhat unlikely that even for a large institution, they would have multiple uh, serious findings against them within two years of each other, but it's nonetheless possible. And I don't know if it's a good idea to say that a second finding would be precluded uh, a second reprimand would be precluded simply because of the existence of the first one. So I'm going to give you the argument for why I think it should stay in. I, th I think that the, the language is included so that if, um, if there is a violation with any entity um, and they have an opportunity to correct their behavior and it's not made public, um, there's an incentive for them to continue in the correct behavior if they know that they repeat the bad behavior, the second incident is going to be public. So taking this sentence out really weakens the incentive for the bad actor to continue to um, on a good path because if if they can always come and say, oh, give us a private reprimand, there's never any public disclosure of their bad acts. This says you get, you know, as they would say, you know, each dog gets one bite, this dog gets one bite, and then if there's a second incident, the um, then the dog, you know, is going to face trouble, or the dog's owner is going to face trouble. I see. Uh, I see Jennifer is your hand right up, but I well, kind of read that as uh, there wouldn't be a um, available uh, or an available sanction that could be taken against the party for the next two years. Um, since, but I think in that case, maybe it might be useful to uh, clarify similar disposition and clarify that that does not encompass public recommend, reprimands. I think uh, similar dip disposition does encompass, well, it, similar disposition refers to private reprimand. Yeah. So you could say should not be eligible for No. For two years. Jen, I'm sorry. No, that's okay. And I could be very well not reading this correctly because I don't, I maybe I just needed to read the top, but how does the commission, I thought, I'm a little bit confused as how the commission is doing anything because 
not the whole body knows, right? I, I like I'm a little bit lost in that aspect of like the commission is making a reprimand. Who were they reprimanding if not the entire but I thought the entire commission doesn't necessarily know. So this language again was like a sample that was from the town of Arlington. So we'd have to go back and clear it, clean it up to make it uh, really match for the um, the way in which the HRC is working with the director. But it basically, I think the director would have an investigation, confer with the co-chairs, and then you know, based on their findings, there would be a suggestion for a private reprimand. And um, and then, there, you know, that creates a record for obviously for the commission, they have that. And then if the same uh, individual is back before the commission again, it's no longer a private reprimand. The commission then makes a public statement about the actions of, of the actor. So basically, if this was, it's being used currently. And so we've got two from Amherst College. So mm -hmm. the first time you wouldn't say anything out loud. Right. But did you did you reprimand them at all? Or I don't. I, I didn't. But I mean, and what is the we reprimand? Don't, we, so I, I know, really. <laughs> so, I mean, the um, I think uh, the goal is that there would be private conversation between the commission and whomever the bad actor is. So it could be a letter, it could be whatever. I mean, this obviously, this was a sample, so it needs to, um, to be cleaned up. But the idea is that if a person has um, been given sort of a private conversation about their actions, and then they act again, you get a similar complaint. So the Amherst College one is a perfect example. You wouldn't, You would not remain private about it. But is that true if somebody complained about the PD? Because then that's something completely different because we don't have any anything with the PD and then it becomes like a personnel matter. So I, so the, I, I don't I'm know. I'm just if trying to think of the different yeah. Yeah. scenarios. So I don't think, I don't think the, the police department is a good example because anything that happens to police officers has to be done according to collective bargaining. So that sort of let's take them off the table, but let's um, uh, let's use an, an and their collective bargaining agreement is very specific about discipline. But let's use another town department, um, you know. Uh, building inspector. Right. Building inspector. We get two complaints that there's been a problem with the building inspector. We might. Go through our investigation, come up with a solution sit down with, have a conciliatory conference, sit down with uh, Dave and the building inspector, and that conversation might be private. It won't because we're a public entity. But, um, and then when there's a second incident, so maybe uh, a, another business might be a better, then there's an opportunity for that, uh, to have that, um, to have the admonishment be, um, you know, to be public. And the the reprimand or the admonishment could be simply a statement like issued by the HRC that, um, you know, a notice to the press, we've received five complaints in the last six months against blah, blah, blah for the following things. I guess I think yeah. that it, it's a tight line when we start talking about employees as mm -hmm. versus other entities. Mm -hmm. Because even with a building inspector, that still ends up being, a, it, in theory, it should be a personnel ma matter if mm -hmm. something is so egre egregious that we, you know what I mean, that we, then HR should be involved. And once HR right. is involved and that becomes a whole nother thing, which we don't typically right. announce to people mm -hmm. that we have personnel matters right well pun we don't say what the punishment in theory was for the birth for the action so i and maybe as we go on further like just i feel like there needs to, otherwise it just seems like and particularly honestly like a lot of people do want to i feel like they have a place and even though that rob is not set up rob is not set up yet so in the meantime if people have complaints about the pd they're gonna funnel them through us um I just, I feel like they're, yeah. I yeah, mean, I, I think, know this is just a. Yeah, I think that this section, I mean, I don't think that 
thinking about uh, the um, a town department is a good example, but think about another business. So CVS, yeah, but, you yeah. told me that that there've been lots, that there've been several complaints or there were several complaints at one time against CVS. So you might at the, the first CVS and they're a private entity, private corporation, we can't really tell them what to do, but we can issue the results of our investigation. At the end of that investigation, we might say blah, 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 and it's a private report. But then when the second CVS uh, complaint comes in, then there's this sentence just simply says there's no guarantee that if you act, if you have the same complaint within a two year period, that you, there will be a private reprimand. I I actually like this. And I don't think the fact that it's an HR matter should prevent it from being dealt with through the Human Rights Commission. It should be recognized still as a human rights violation. Um, I think these complexities have to be dealt with on a case-by-case -case basis. But the principle that's in the bylaws is that whatever you know, bad thing we say about you, whatever bad judgment we lay on you, that will be private only once. Mm -hmm. um, and that the next time it's not gonna be private, whatever it is mm -hmm. and whoever it's directed at. And, you know, I don't think the town should be exempt. I don't think town don't, yeah. department should be exempt. Um, we may not want to name a police officer, especially if that officer is acting in a way that's consistent with police policy, but we can name the department. We can yeah. question police policy as being something that violates people's human rights. Yeah. So I don't I like not, having this. Yeah, I don't disagree with it. I just want to make sure like it's important like when you're thinking about doing this, you, you have to try to make sure that all the, the mm -hmm. boxes fit in there in some way. And so maybe that's the exact way is that you just name the department as opposed to an individual and then that changes that. But, and you're right, the town shouldn't be exempt from it. And so you have to use it to some degree as an example because you have to be able to flush that out. But I I don't necessarily disagree. It It's a good idea. I just wanted to wash it out a little bit, I guess, to make sure that it would fit. And then, yeah, that was it. Yeah. So I think um, I will try, tomorrow is a tough day to do a turnaround because Jen and I have a cup of joe in the morning and then there's a staff uh, picnic in the afternoon and there's one other document that I'm trying to get out tomorrow afternoon. Um, but I think early next week, I can uh, try to send this back out to you guys, uh, cleaned up a bit with some of the suggestions that have been made and um, you can take a look. Uh, bef you know, that would give you at least a week to look at it before the next HRC meeting. Okay, so I'll type up my little paragraph and send it to everyone after we finish right now before I forget what I was going to say. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So is that is that do you need another meeting next week or is or can we just circulate the proposed document at the HRC meeting that's coming up on the 21st? Yeah. I don't okay think we this. need an I don't think we need another meeting, but it would be good for us to look at it one more time. Sure. by email before circulating it. I don't know, yeah. Philip. Yeah, I'll, just, that, just to... yeah, that works with me. Mm -hmm. So my goal will be Monday or Tuesday of next week. I'm only working a half day on Tuesday, so but I will definitely get it to you before uh, sometime um, early next week. Yeah. I'm also going to try and finish up the state of the human rights to get that on the agenda for 20. Mm -hmm. The 21st. Okay. Right. Yeah. So, uh, Philip, I did ask if there was anything that you needed from us for that report. Do you, is there any section that you need us to write or? Uh, if you could write the complaints, that would be helpful, actually. Okay. <laughs> okay. And I don't have to read the emails. Okay. And Ronnie, um, I'll, I'll connect with you just to, if you could help me with that. I know we talked sure. about that at one point. Sure. Okay. So, Mike, my goal will be to provide like um, basically just a short 
uh, description of each of the, I think we're up to seven when I went through the last list now, I think of the seven complaints that we've received this year. I'll have to, I have, we have files so I can make sure that that's accurate. Perfect, yep. So it's not the last 12 months, what it covers is this calendar year? Right, so, um, well, from, it it's covers this um, fiscal year for the town. So Jen, oh, since Jen oh. and I started on July 5th, and ah. so from, so June will be the end of the fiscal year. And so it, it, during see. this this year, there's, I think there's been six or seven complaints. All right, well, I think we did good. Yeah. yeah. I just need to save my document. <laughs> yes. <Don't totally>. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. All right, thank, thank you, everybody. You. Bye. 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 Bye.